thanks, Jared, and thanks for the organizers for uh, letting me present my work here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the biophysical constraints and modeling these quantitatively and how we can actually use this to start to understand how does it shape the bacterial metabolome. Um, so Chris in his talk talked a lot about these governing constraints and we're, we're interested in trying to model these specifically mathematically and see how some of them work together maybe to start to constrain the space. And I'd like to start off this kind of uh, this talk thinking about um, this kind of image uh, by David Goodsell at Scripps Research Institute where if we look at the cell, it's a crowded place. There's a lot of different things that constrain the metabolome and cellular function. A lot of them are physical constraints. There's a lot of stuff packed in here, all the nucleic material and proteins and macromolecules and the lipids. And what we're interested in looking at specifically uh, is the metabolome, all of these small molecules involved in energy metabolism, which are too small to even see on an image like this. And so we can start to think about what sorts of biophysical laws and principles start to govern and uh, point to uh, different phenotypic states. Now, there's a variety of different constraints that have been used in the past to model metabolism. Um, a lot of this work is in the field of uh, flux balance analysis and using constraint-based modeling to model and compute the genotype-phenotype relationship. And when we talk about that in terms of metabolism, uh, a lot of what these models do is they compute different feasible uh, flux states of the network. So they compute pathway usage based on different, uh, different constraints that are mathematically expressed based on measured omics data. And so some of these types of constraints come from gene expression and protein expression, uh, metabolomics data, and if we have information available on different kinetic parameters, we can model these mathematically and we can integrate this in with the structure of the metabolic network, and then we can compute a solution space where each point in this space would represent a feasible flux state of the network. So each point represents different pathway usage. And as we add these constraints, we start to zero in on a biophysically and physiologically relevant set of fluxes. And eventually we can optimize uh, and compute maybe a maximal growth rate and then look and see, well, for this given growth rate and the data that we have, this is what we would predict the flux state to be. But in these models, most of what is missing are a lot of these biophysical constraints. So when we model in this kind of framework, we're really assuming away things like pH and maybe some kind of spatial constraints and all of these sorts of energetics and uh, electron neutrality and all of these sorts of things that do obviously play a role. And so the goal here is to translate some of these governing biophysical constraints into quantitative values, so some kind of mathematical form that can help us integrate in with the network structure and actually compute functional states. And ideally, we're able to do this and then look at different environments, either existing ones that we can model and measure or maybe theoretical environments. And so most of what I'm going to talk about today is a theoretical framework that we've put together that allows us to model. We've put together 10 different classes of constraints. Eight of these are really biophysical constraints. Then we have a couple uh, constraints that we use to uh, address technological uh, issues with integrating data like this into uh, a framework like this. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time. This is a very dense image. But a couple things that I want to point out is we've formulated all of these constraints with only a single free variable, and that's x, the metabolite concentration. All of the other parameters are either measured values, things like the turgor pressure for a given system, membrane potential, uh, ionic strength of a solution, or they are, in the case of like thermodynamics, for example, these are Gibbs free energies of formation for individual compounds, and these are quantities that can be computed or uh, some measured. Uh, and so when we started to try to put together this framework, that was one of the the first issues is where do we get that kind of data? Um, and so some, some work by some of my colleagues in my dissertation lab uh, spent some time and we used an updated group contribution method to estimate some of these necessary parameters, some of these thermodynamic quantities that allow us to parameterize everything I just showed you on the last slide. Um, and of course, 
using constraints to look at these sorts of things is not novel. Um, really, the novelty here, we hope, is to try to integrate all of these constraints together into a single unified framework to start to look at some of these things. Uh, but certainly, just looking at thermodynamics and some of these thermodynamic properties has been done previously and extensively. Um, and some recent work from our lab uh, used these computed parameters to look at the evolution, uh, the evolutionary trajectory of different pathways based on thermodynamic feasibility. And some of the more interesting uh, outcomes from uh, that study was that for two different organisms living in different niches, for them to produce the same biomass precursor, they might have substantially different pathway usage, and it's based on environmental conditions. And if we can start to model that, we can start to understand maybe why one organism might use one route and one might use another. And ultimately, it came down, um, one of the observations is that uh, these different pathways might depend on different cofactors, and those are different um, important uh, parameters that can affect, based on the environmental conditions, what sort of pathways. The other thing I want to comment about uh, this framework we've put together is that some of the models we were using to look at individual constraints are fairly high level, and if you do have a more sophisticated model, this framework is modular. So for example, some separate work we're doing is to look at the membrane potential, and we want to integrate membrane potential as a constraint when we're interested in computing these phenotypic states for these cells. And so we've uh, built a model of the uh, spatial model of the membrane, and for the human red blood cell, there's a lot of uh, data available for the uh, phospholipid composition of the lipid bilayer. And so for this, for this framework, the free variable here that we're looking at is the individual concentrations of all of the phospholipids in the network. And so you can actually determine um, from available measured data, we were able to compute how much sphingomyelin or phosphatidylserine is on one side of the lipid or the other, uh, of the bilayer or the other, and then we can compute the potential and then we can integrate this in with this larger genome scale framework and see, well, given a specific set of phospholipids, given this membrane composition, how does that constrain metabolism? Or we could ask the other question, which is, what would we want metabolism to look like in order to generate a specific uh, phospholipid composition, for example? And so again, th this is also work in progress, but just to say that if you have a more sophisticated model and better measurements for some of these different constraints and you think about them in different ways, this sort of framework could uh, encapsulate that sort of thing. One of the other constraints that I mentioned that is a very important one when we're talking about modeling and computing these phenotypic states is accounting for the effect of pH on small molecules. And so when we talk about in kind of broad terms these metabolic networks, we really just think of metabolites as ATP. But in reality, ATP exists as one of many different protonation states that is possible based on a lot of different things in the network. And as the pH of the system changes, there's a different dominant species of ATP. It might be bound to magnesium or a different charge state. And so this is, um, again, one of the constraints that we're using to, uh, based on the pH of the system, we can modulate which of the metabolite species are most dominant. So uh, we're currently in the process of applying this framework to look at different case studies. And one of the first case studies uh, that I'm going to talk about here in my limited time today is uh, modeling E. coli uh, in exponential growth at pH of 7.5. Um, and so. We're currently in the process of scaling up to genome scale, and right now we've been tuning these parameters and looking at these constraints on a, a smaller version of the network that contains glycolysis and the TCA cycle, so a total of about 45 metabolites. And what I'm showing here, uh, this is the same data on the top, it's an absolute scale, and on the bottom it's on log scale. Um, so what I'm showing here is we've computed the, uh, these bars represent the minimum and the maximum uh, feasible concentration according to these constraints that we've uh, laid out. Um, and then the yellow points here are data that has been measured in the literature uh, from Joshua Rabin Rabinowitz's lab. Um, and we can map that on and start to see wh how well does this, do these mathematical constraints work out, how well do they play together. Um, we're still fine-tuning some things, but certainly uh, one thing that we've been able to notice so far is that the upper bounds on a lot of these different metabolite concentrations uh, 
has been modulated by the different constraints, and we've performed some sensitivity analysis to start to see how do those start to, uh, to change. Um, and certainly one of the, the next things that we're going to try to figure out is why in this current framework do some of these lower bounds all just kind of map all the way to zero? There, there's got to be some lower bound on those. So that's, that's part of where the, the current status of this work is. And once we've defined this very complex optimization problem that we use to compute this space. Really, we're interested in characterizing this space is the first step. Um, and so th there's some interesting questions that we can start to look at once we've built these constraints. And really, the goal here is to try to identify how do these different constraints interact with each other? Are there some constraints that are more dominant than others and under certain conditions? And so, for example, we can look at things like uh, the buffer capacity as a function of total metabolite concentration and see, uh, so if this, uh, uh, if the color bar here represents the specific concentration of that individual metabolite, we can see how its buffer capacity might change in the context of all of the constraints for the whole network um, and see how the that might affect a property like the buffer capacity. And like I mentioned, the more interesting part of once we're able to characterize this network is to see how do these different bounds, once we've computed them, how do they change as we modulate some maybe of the, the global measured parameters, like the turgor pressure. If we were to change the turgor pressure, does that maybe modulate one of the upper bounds? Um, if we change the pH, certainly the ratios of different protonation states of the same metabolite would change. And ultimately, then we can begin to answer the question, how do constraints work together to constrain the metabolome? Um, so looking ahead. Uh, a lot of our interest in this kind of framework as engineers is, well, can we engineer the metabolome? So if we can characterize this space, can we start to maybe predict how do maybe gene knockouts or a change in media composition begin to alter this, this feasible state? Um, and, and perhaps for an audience uh, here, what can these biophysical constraints teach us about different states of metabolism, and why do certain metabolites, like um, trehalose, for example, act as osmoregulators in different systems? Is this framework something that we can begin to start to ask and answer questions like these? Um, so just to summarize, we've described a framework uh, that allows for the translation of governing biophysical constraints into a mathematical framework that we're then going to use to compute functional metabolic states. And what we're attempting to do next is to compute this, to characterize this space through computation, through computation and look at the feasibility of different metabolic configurations in theoretical or hypothesized environments, and even have the capacity, once we characterize this space, to perhaps generate in silico metabolism data sets that would at least obey all of the biophysical laws that we've laid out here. Um, so I'd like to finish by thanking uh, my colleagues in this endeavor. So this is work that I had started in my uh, PhD, uh, and since I've left, has been taken over by uh, Amir. Um, and obviously, would also like to thank my doctoral advisor, Professor Paulson uh, at UC San Diego, and Dan Zielinski has also been instrumental in guiding this work. Um, of course, I like, would, would like to thank the um, Nova Nordisk Foundation Center for Biosustainability and my fellowship here at the Institute for Systems Biology uh, in Seattle for funding. And with that, I will take any questions. Maybe one quick question while we get set up for the next speaker. There's a mic up at the front or... So I, I kind of wonder if you're generating hypotheses, predictions, Explanations. I mean, it's, you, you. I mean, you. You sort of. It's really cool and amazing. I just wonder if, if you believe the answers, or are you convinced of the answers? I don't need to take any more measurements, or do, or, or you know, or, or, or maybe we should take new measurements to validate the model that you have. So I think that last point is actually really what we're trying to get at. Is so certainly measuring metabolomics data and mapping onto this space can tell us something. So many of those points, about 80%, were within the ranges we computed. Some of them were outside those ranges. And so obviously, we need to, to tune the network. But likely, we will potentially need more data in order to better fine tune these constraints. Another interesting thing to think about is, are there other constraints that we're not considering that cause our predictions to be off. Um, and so ultimately, we would like to use this for um, hypothesis generation, but that's, I think, a little ways down the road. First, we really need to validate this, and exactly to your point, can we trust what we're actually computing here? All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, next up.